car that runs on water instead of gasoline. Can it be true? Well, inventor Stanley Meyer made an announcement today in Colorado Springs. He says he's come up with a device that will hook up to any engine and allow it to run on good old H2O. Water is everywhere. You drink it, wash with it, and watch it fall from the sky. Now, picture this. You pour water into a tank, turn a key, and your car drives away with no gasoline at all. Sounds like magic, right? But one inventor said it was real, and he put his name on patents to prove it. His name was Stanley Meyer. Supporters call him a genius. Critics call him a fraud. Either way, his water car story still sparks fights, hope, and big questions about energy, power, and truth. It leads to one question we all ask. The big claim. Meyer's story starts with a feeling most people understand. Gas is expensive. Politics around oil is ugly and the planet is paying the bill. He would say, why are we digging for fuel when we are surrounded by it? In his view, the answer was water. Not because water burns, but because it can be split into hydrogen and oxygen. He described a future where you fill a tank at a faucet, then drive as far as you like. Supporters repeat a famous brag, a trip across the United States on a small amount of water, then back again. To them, it sounded like freedom, Freedom from oil companies. Freedom from fuel prices. Freedom from the idea that energy must always be scarce. Meyer claimed he built more than a sketch. He said he built a working system and attached it to a normal internal combustion engine. The engine still had pistons, valves, and timing. The difference was the fuel. Instead of gasoline, he said he produced a fuel gas from water, then fed that gas into the engine. He also hinted at generators that could power homes and small businesses. People who met him described the same mix, confidence, secrecy, and urgency. He talked about patents, investors, and a new energy economy. He also talked about danger. In many retellings, he warned that powerful groups would fight him because if water became fuel, oil would lose its grip. That threat, real or imagined, turned his work into a kind of crusade what running on water really means. At the center of the claim is a simple chemical fact. Water is H2O. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. If you separate those atoms, you get hydrogen and oxygen gases in a two to one mix. When you burn hydrogen with oxygen, you make water again and release heat. That heat can push an engine, just like gasoline does. The catch is also simple. Water is already the end of that reaction. It is like smoke after a fire. To turn it back into fuel, you must put energy in first. In standard electrolysis, electricity splits water. Then the hydrogen stores that energy. Later, when you burn it, you get the stored energy back. It is not a cheat code, it is a conversion. Maya said his system broke that rule. He talked about resonance and pulsed electrical signals. The idea, as he explained it, was not to brute force electrolysis with high current. Instead, he claimed he could tune electric pulses so the water molecules would respond like a swing being pushed at the right rhythm. He described the water inside his cell as stressed, aligned, and easier to break. He would talk about voltage and current control and support circuits that made the process efficient. Some fans add a huge claim on top of that, saying the output could be hundreds or even thousands of times greater than the input. And one number that gets repeated is 1,800 times. That kind of number is exactly why people either lean forward in awe or lean back in disbelief. The demos and the locked door. Stories about Maya almost always include a scene that feels like a movie. Visitors arrive. The workshop is controlled cameras are not welcome. Work parts are kept behind closed doors. Some say the device was set up inside a two-story building so the public could not walk in and copy it. Others say he would only show the full run to people he trusted or people who looked ready to invest. In one common version, the vehicle is not driven down a highway for a full day. It is driven in circles, upstairs, in a tight space. To believers, that detail is funny, but not damning. They say he was protecting his invention. To skeptics, it is a red flag. They say real science is not afraid of open testing. Meyer filed patents, and he used that fact as proof that his work was real. To many fans, a patent feels like a stamp of approval. 
In reality, a patent mostly proves you filed a detailed idea, not that it works as claimed. Still, patents fueled the legend. So did the simple explanation people loved to repeat. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, split it, ignite it, and go. The simplicity is seductive, because it makes the breakthrough feel close enough to touch. As the story spread, Meyer tried to turn curiosity into funding. He talked to investors and hinted at deals. Supporters say he was careful because once money enters the room, so do lies and spies. Critics say the secrecy was convenient because it avoided independent proof. Either way, those private demos became the core of his reputation. People did not just hear about the water car. Some say they watched it move, heard it idling, and smelled the exhaust. That kind of memory sticks, even decades later. The Wall of Skepticism Every revolutionary claim eventually meets a simple demand. Show the numbers, how much energy goes in, how much comes out, what is measured, and who measures it. Here, Maya's story hits a wall. Scientists pointed out that you cannot get net energy from water alone. If you split water using electricity from a battery or alternator, you are just moving energy around. You might build a hydrogen on demand system, but the engine will still be limited by the energy you supplied to make the gas. That is why many engineers said the self-running part could not be true without some hidden energy source. In the 1990s, conflict became legal. Two investors sued Meyer, saying they were duped after paying for rights tied to his technology. In that case, expert witnesses examined what was presented and testified that the cell looked like conventional electrolysis, not a new physical law. The court ruled against Meyer and described the situation as fraud. That ruling is a key reason many people dismiss the whole story today, no matter how exciting the claim sounds. Supporters respond with their own points. They say courts do not decide physics. They say the tests were limited, or the wrong parts were examined, or that Meyer refused full access because he feared theft. They argue that a breakthrough can look ordinary from the outside, like a safe looks like a box until you know the code. This back and forth is why the debate never dies. The paperwork points one way, but personal stories point another. And when an idea promises freedom from bills and wars, people want it to be true. That emotional pull can be stronger than any diagram. The death, the rumors, and the lesson. On March 20th, 1998, Stanley Meyer collapsed while dining with two Belgian investors and his brother. The official cause of death was a cerebral aneurysm, a sudden failure in a blood vessel in the brain. But supporters added a dramatic detail that spread fast, that he ran outside and shouted that he had been poisoned. Whether that happened exactly as told or not, the rumor fit the shape of the story. If the invention threatens oil, then the inventor must have enemies. It is a clean plot line, and people remember plot lines. After his death, the technology did not roll out to the public. That absence became its own kind of proof to believers. They say the work was seized, hidden, bought, and buried. Critics say the simpler answer is the best one. If it worked, others could replicate it, and it would not vanish. The truth is, both sides use the same evidence gap for opposite conclusions. So what should we take from it? First, the world really does need cleaner energy, and hydrogen is part of that conversation. Second, big claims demand open tests. If a device can change the world, it should survive the brightest light. Finally, the Maya legend shows how hope and distrust can mix into a powerful myth. It is not only a story about a machine, it is a story about how badly people want an escape hatch, and how careful we must be before we follow one, where the idea lives today. Even if Maya's specific machine never worked as advertised, the question he raised did not vanish. Today, real engineers still split water, but they do it with clear accounting. Large electrolyzers use electricity to make hydrogen. That electricity can come from solar, wind, nuclear, or the grid. The hydrogen can then be stored, shipped, and used in fuel cells, or burned in turbines. It is not free, but it can be cleaner, especially when the input power is clean. That is the honest version of water as fuel. Water is the feedstock, 
Electricity is the price. There is also a smaller truth that often gets mixed into the myth. Some hobby systems inject tiny amounts of hydrogen and oxygen into an engine. People call it HHO or oxyhydrogen. Sometimes they report a smoother idle or small efficiency changes. Often that comes from tuning effects, airflow changes, or drivers paying closer attention. Not because water is creating extra energy. The big claim that an alternator can power a cell that makes enough gas to run the same engine and also provide extra power runs into the same wall as before. Without an outside energy source, the math does not close. So when you hear it was suppressed, ask two questions. Can it be repeated by an independent team? And can measurements be checked publicly? If the answer is yes, the idea will spread on its own because the world would pay attention fast. If the answer is no, the story is more about belief than engineering. So can a car run on water? Not the simple magical way people want, but the dream behind that question is still worth pursuing. Water can help make hydrogen and hydrogen can power engines and fuel cells if you supply energy to produce it. Stanley Meyer turned that science into a bold story and sold it like a revolution. Maybe he was a visionary who could not prove it. Maybe he was a salesman who pushed too far. Either way, his legend pushes us to test, measure and think for ourselves every day before we hand our hope away.